Good morning, good afternoon, I guess it is. Bonjour for the uh, POSBD. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Beth Brody, who will introduce um, um, Meg, and then she will, and then Meg will continue after that. Okay, well, it is with my great pleasure that I introduce my friend and my committee member, Meg Ostrom. Um, I met Meg through the Enfleur Sister City Exchange Committee and have since come to know her as one of the most creative, curious, and scholarly people I know. And I say scholarly, not just because she is has been the curator of many museums, of a myriad of museums and museum exhibits, and also um, because she's an author and because she has served on um, several local and national boards for the arts, um, or because of her really interesting work with um, Vermont Folk Life Center. And you already know probably all of this because I'm sure you read about her on our really great um, Alliance Francaise website. Um, but I really look at Meg as a scholar because she delves into these really deep stories. Um, and so often these days, all we get is a sound bite. Um, and so I know that you're going to really enjoy hearing about um, a story that has really been a lifelong journey for Meg and has um, shaped a lot of what she has done in her um, adult life. And um, and after this, I hope you also really enjoy reading The Surgeon and the Shepherd. It's a, it's a really fascinating book. And as Eric said, there'll be time at the end for questions. So I'm going to turn this over to Meg, and um, she will talk all about her adventure. Thanks, Beth. Um, wow. Well, what a pleasure um, uh, to do this today. Um, it, it's been a while, um, uh, but it, it, it sort of comes in waves, and um, and every every encounter is, is enriching for me. Um, I love to hear people's reactions um, and shared stories. So let's start. So today, I want to take you on an armchair journey to the Pyrenees and retrace my unexpected path from hiker to history detective. Some of you have read my book, The Surgeon and the Shepherd, others not yet. Um, no matter which camp you fall into, I think this presentation will help you better visualize the physical setting so central to the World War II resistance story I documented, and also give you greater insight into my motivation and the process of recovering historical memory. First, some geographic orientation. I know some of you have been introduced to the Basque region through Tim and Ben Khan's film, The Last Link, but perhaps um, there are people participating today who have actually hiked in the Western Pyrenees or walked the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. Likely many of you have read Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises and recall when Jake Barnes goes fishing in the Rio Irati. Or perhaps as a French student, you read The Song of Roland. So via literature, you have been in the Southwest border region of France and Spain, the site of this World War II resistance story. I first visited the Basque country in the late fall of 1983 as part of a trip to explore the southern tier of France via car and on foot. Though I had previously traveled <clears throat> extensively in France, the geography and culture of this region were virtually foreign to me and to my traveling companion, like me, a Vermonter who shared a love of France, French literature, and curiosity about contemporary rural culture. Our scant knowledge consisted of of memories of reading the Song of Roland in high school French, plus the basic information uh, that we gleaned from tourist <clears throat> guidebooks. So I'd like to show you a series of slides to introduce the inland Basque country, specifically the Loribar Valley and its environs. As you can see, it is a pastoral landscape defined by a dense patchwork of small farms. It's a place where rural tradition persists, those are beehives, um, and where animal power is still important and where animals commonly share the road with people. <laughs> Moving to the surrounding mountains, these are the foothills of the Western Pyrenees, also called the Basse Pyrenees. We're at about 3000 feet. 
In contrast to the dense clustering of the valley farms, what you see in this vast upland terrain are isolated shepherd's summer compounds. And here, up in the mountains, straddling the French-Spanish border, is also the Irati Forest, the largest beech forest in Europe. For someone from Vermont, sheep, small villages and farms, and the rugged landscape gave it a certain recognizability. But the French Basque country has a very different atmosphere. It's much more open and much harsher because of being so heavily grazed over millennia. The slopes have a shaved quality. Also, it feels more mysterious and ominous. Um, here we're looking to the High Pyrenees. Unlike Vermont, Iron Age monuments are highly visible. Um, this is Oka Bay, a necropolis of Cromlex on a mountain plateau. It's because of this mountain called the Peak de Bejorlegi that I would eventually meet this man, the surgeon of the book's titles. The last day of our short visit to the Basque country, my companion Del and I wanted to spend the afternoon hiking in the mountains. We got a tourist brochure describing various excursions and decided to do an abbreviated walk on Bejorlegi, the highest mountain in the immediate region of Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, the picturesque market town where we were staying. Bejorlegi is kind of like Camel's Hump in Vermont, where it's a geographic landmark seen from a great distance. <clears throat> the instructions directed hikers to park by the village church and then begin the ascent via the gravel road. As we were putting on our date packs, the local priest spied us from the parsonage across the lane and asked if we needed help. We learned from Abbe Erdozensi that we were in Mendiv, not the village of Bejorlegi. And when we told him our plan, he quickly discouraged us because the mist was starting to envelop the mountain. Clearly intrigued by the presence of two French-speaking American hikers on a misty afternoon, he invited us in for coffee. Certain that Vermont was not on his mental map, we explained we lived in a mountainous region north of Boston. When he heard the word Boston, his facial expression transformed into delight. Immediately, he began narrating <clears throat> an amazing story of what had gone on in this now sleepy border area during World War II. Imagine a community in the Northeast Kingdom like Holland or Troy. He told us that a secret cell of the Belgian resistance had come to Mendiv, renovated a large lumbering and milling operation, which they ran as a cover to enable them to pass people and documents out of France. A young Belgian ophthalmologist using the name Jacques Perrault was the mastermind of this top secret underground railroad scheme. Eventually the Germans got wind of this subversive activity and when they came to arrest him, he finessed a very, danger, a very daring and dangerous escape to Spain. After the war, Monsieur Perrault had emigrated to Boston and become a world famous eye surgeon. The priest explained that he had not been in the village during the war, but that he had arranged a ceremony 25 years later when the Belgians had returned to place a commemorative plaque on an important mountain chapel. He searched for a few minutes, then showed us um, a black and white photo from the ceremony. That's the, uh, the photo that he showed us. Mm. Then came the next surprise of the afternoon. He offered to take us up to see the plaque, an offer we couldn't refuse. En route, he showed us the former site of the sawmill in the center of the village, now a large pasture. He explained that an elaborate cable system had relayed the logs down from the mountaintop Irati forest. At the Chapelle Saint Sauveur, we photographed him next to the plaque. As our tour guide, though, he was frustrated because he couldn't rem remember Monsieur Perrault's real name. <laughs> So on our descent, we stopped off <clears throat> at a few farmhouses where he introduced us and inquired whether anyone else remembered, but no luck. The final stop on our two hour tour was the village church in Bejorlegi, the place where we should have parked. The priest <laughs> took us inside and we asked if we might return for the mass on Sunday. And since I was being treated for a corneal problem at Mass Ioneer in Boston, I offered to relay a letter from the priest to the eye surgeon. I figured he would be able to recall his real name when he wrote the letter. However, when we returned that Sunday and he gave me the letter after the mass, I realized that its delivery was gonna take some sleuthing. 
This was the beginning of my transformation from hiker to history detective. I assumed that the way to solve the mystery would be to ask my ophthalmologist at my next appointment at Mass Eye and Ear if she knew of such a Belgian eye surgeon. However, in this tale of coincidence, it was actually on my first day back at the Vermont Council on the Arts, mm -hmm. where I was working as the state museum coordinator, that I discovered his identity. As part of sharing my travel adventures with my office mate, Jane Beck, the state folklorist, I told her about the encounter in the Basque Village and my mission to find the legendary war hero, Jacques Perrault, and deliver the letter. To my astonishment, she said, I think I know who he is. His name is Charles Scapens, and he's the man who saved my eyesight. Her uncle was a great friend of Dr. Scapens and had referred Jane to him for treatment when she developed diabetic retinopathy. She remembered that her uncle had mentioned that Dr. Scapens was Belgian and had fought in the resistance in the south of France. Indeed, a phone call confirmed the lead. There were about five seconds of silence when I told him that I had been in Mendive and had brought back a letter from Monsieur Perrault and thought he was the, the person to whom it should be delivered. His first words were, how did you find me? <laughs> and so I explained the fortuitous connection with Jane. When I proposed an appointment to deliver the letter, he said that he was very busy during the day and didn't do social appointments, but would like to invite me instead to be his guest at an upcoming Winter Pops concert at the Ritz-Carlton to benefit his Eye Institute. I accepted, but wanted to know how we would recognize each other. His response was a preview of his unassuming character. He described himself as a man of medium height with a high forehead and thinning hair. I told him I had black curly hair and wore glasses. I recognized him easily because he was wearing the same blazer and striped tie that I had seen in the photo the priest had showed us. Um, <laughs> he greeted me very cordially and took me into the ballroom where he sat me next to his wife at the head table. Both Dr. and Mrs. Scapin stood out because of their understated attire in this sea of glamorous patrons. Then he went to the, back to, to the lobby. I showed Mrs. Scapin's the photos of the priest next to the chapel and asked if she had ever been to Mendive. She looked at me in consternation saying, why I was there too during the war. <laughs> I apologized for my faux pas and luckily Dr. Scapin's then reappeared. She shared the photos with him, and then I gave him the priest's letter just before the concert started. I spied him reading the letter in his lap as the music played. At the intermission, he popped up and headed for the lobby, and soon the, inst the Institute's development officer approached the table. She explained that Dr. Scapins was a very reserved man, but that he had been very touched by the priest's words. I indicated that I was so honored to meet him, but had many questions to ask him. She volunteered to send me a chapter from a book that would give a fuller description of his resistance activities. A few days later, I got Xeroxed material from a book by William Uge, one of the leaders of the Belgian resistance, plus literature about the Scapin's Eye Research Institute. Reading the institute literature, I discovered that Dr. Scapin's was considered the father of modern retinal surgery and thus was a hero twice over. Reading Uge's account was interesting and informative, but it was somewhat different than the oral version I had heard from the priest. Indeed, the unusual sequence of events that had taken me from the humble Mendive parsonage to the Ritz ballroom made me feel for the first time in my life that I had truly fallen down a rabbit hole. Though I had fulfilled my initial mission as a messenger, like Lewis Carroll's Alice, I was getting curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> I thought that writing some kind of short travel piece would help make sense of this extended adventure so filled with coincidences. Yet I knew that before I could write intelligently, I needed to do background research on both Basque culture and World War II escape lines in the Pyrenees. I also tried unsuccessfully to set up a follow-up session with Dr. Scapins when I knew I would be in Boston. He suggested that instead I meet his wife for tea since she had more time. I met her at a cafe on Beacon Hill and she gave me a few wartime photos um, of Dr. Scapins with her two young children. I could sense her awkwardness though. She said, frankly, the war had been a difficult period of her life 
uh, that she had tried to forget and that this was her husband's story. In the spring of 1987, I decided to make a return trip to Mendive, this time as a more informed traveler. Monsieur le Curé took me to meet a few older villagers who had firsthand memories of Monsieur Perrault and his family, a man who had worked in the sawmill and a woman whose family were his neighbors and landlord. I learned more about daily life during the war and the relationship between Monsieur Perrault, the locals and the Germans. In fact, I learned not only had he changed his name and identity, but he had posed as a collaborator. I also learned about the history of the sawmill before, during, and after the war. Remember that pasture I showed you early on? Um, this is a historic postcard of uh, the sawmill in its heyday um, <clears throat> um, in the late 20s on that site. And I was given a copy of, of a book written as a memoir spy tale about the secret operation of the Mendive sawmill written by the same William Uge. Mm -hmm. Having met a few eyewitnesses and read the book, I was ever more determined to talk to doc Dr. Scapins one-on-one. -on -one. My diligence indeed was rewarded because this time when I called him and told him my, about my return trip to Mendive, he invited me to dinner at his house north of Boston. My three hour audience with him afterwards revealed a man who wanted to be a quiet hero, a man who like so many who aided in the resistance considered his contribution patriotic, an act of duty, an act of decency. His narrative was filled with praise of others, particularly Jean Serochard, the Basque shepherd who had served as the passeur or guide for high-level Belgian and allied officials and resistance agents in flight. I arrived thinking this long-awaited session would be the culmination of my journalistic investigation. <laughs> but when I finally heard his narrative compared to the other written or oral accounts, I had the revelation that rather than writing an accidental traveler's tale about my experiences, I should instead devote my efforts to fully documenting an important but obscure story of citizen resistance and heroism that had only been told in a fragmentary way and never from the perspective of the protagonist. In a word, this project had the sense of calling. No question the idea appealed to me because of my passion for doing historical research. The material I'd uncovered so far was like showing gold flecks to a prospector. But the motivation went beyond that. This story, or as much as I knew about it at the time, had really struck something deep in my psyche, that I had arrived as a carefree hiker in Mendive in my early 30s, virtually the same age when Charles Scapins had risked his private and professional life to direct a clandestine service for the Belgian resistance in the very same Basque community, made me realize that it was the subject of moral courage that so engaged me. Growing up as part of the me generation and now living in the era of self-fulfillment of the 1980s, it was clear that the caliber of hero that Charles Scapins represented was, if not obsolete, at least in short supply in a time that gave preference to celebrities and anti-heroes. I conveyed my interest to Dr. Scapins in doing more research and to my great relief, he agreed he would now be open to being interviewed as part of an in-depth oral history project. I didn't know that it was gonna take more than 10 years and he didn't either. Um, there are several reasons why it took so long. To begin with, I had a day job and the informants were scattered. Also, I was a novice field worker and needed time to process details and different interpretations. Not having the pressure of a contract, I could prolong my investigation and let observations, my observations ferment. Looking back, there were really two periods of field research. The first phase lasted almost six years. I interviewed Dr. Scapins three or four times um, a year. And in these two one to two hour sessions, we go back and forth between French and English. He willingly answered my questions, but he never volunteered information I hadn't solicited. He was checking me out as much as I was trying to gauge the clarity of his memories and credibility. He did give me, give me leads of key people to talk to in France and Belgium. 
And once we spent a day traveling around Belgium together to visit key <clears throat> places in his biography. Here we are in his hometown of Moucon, which is in the Walloon or Southern section of Belgium, um, just on the French border. He's 81 here, peeking over the wall of what, what had been his family home at the edge of the town's business district. Our visit to Moucron underscored the importance of place in evoking memory. Previously, I had conveyed my surprise that an ophthalmologist could take on the responsibility of running a sawmill. And he had told me about his summers as a Boy Scout in the Ardennes and practicing forestry skills. Um, when we were in Mucron, <clears throat> he described the hours sitting up in a tree at the back of the property, watching the men at work at the, lot, at the local sawmill next door. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Fortunately, the events of the war were still in living memory and many participants or witnesses were still alive. However, his closest co-conspirators, Anselme Verny and Cyril Pomerantsev had recently died. Mm -hmm. Verny, a Belgian pilot turned resistance agent, had been the chief courier for the network Dr. Skapens worked with. Pomerantsev was a Russian refugee and successful entrepreneur in Paris, whose office furnishings brokerage firm had purchased and bankrolled the Mendiv lumber business. And Jean Serochard was gone as well. On my return visits to Mendive, I interviewed people Dr. Scapens had suggested, who in turn recommended others in the Basque country or other parts of France who had worked for or with the Compagnie d'Iraki. While I tape recorded most of my interviews with Dr. Scapens, most of my interviews in the Basque country were done without a tape machine. A tape machine. I followed the <clears throat> sage advice of my colleague, Jane Beck, who had done field interviews all over the world. Um, and, she, what, and, she, and she told me that in, in cultures where outsiders are suspect, a tape machine would likely be a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. So instead, I filled notebooks with the information I gleaned. For my in, initial interviews, <clears throat> I often went with my passe-partout, Monsieur le Curé. We always were welcomed warmly with drink and special sweets. In this photo, you see Nicolas and Antoine Larissa, shepherds in Bay Horlegi, who told me the stories of shepherds who served as passeurs for evaders and escapers throughout the war, because the valley and mountains had been an active zone of passage from the beginning of the war in 1940. As teenagers up in the mountains with their flocks, they remembered seeing belongings left behind by those in flight. They also told me about les mauvais passeurs, dishonest passeurs who were, had abandoned their clients short of the Spanish border and who were then arrested by French or German guards. In addition, I spent time exploring the mountains and key places in the story. On one trip, Monsieur Le Curé connected me with a mountain guide who took me on a hike through the Irati forest up to the Casa del Rey, the inn just over the Spanish border, which was the destination for p packages and people being relayed out of France. Having experienced the vast openness of much of the mountain terrain surrounding Mendive, I could imagine the relief of those in flight when they finally got to the relative protection of the mountaintop dense beech and pine forest. In the fall of 1991, I spent nearly two and a half weeks in Europe doing field research. I interviewed 12 people in Mendive and its environs. I had become known as la jeune femme américaine qui parle français. <laughs> uh, and people began to seek me out with information they wanted to share. For example, an older shepherd named Cayette Laco took me to the place where Dr. Scapens hid out the first few days of his escape to Spain, um, protected by Jean Serochard. When I later showed this photo to Dr. Scapens, it triggered a whole new batch of stories about his escape. In my interview, I heard lots of stories about Jean Serachar. And uh, um, among the things I learned was that he did not charge for his guiding services, like most of the other Basque passeurs. But I also discovered that his, that his penchant for being a prankster 
and telling tall tales had her earned him the nickname Le Grand Menteur, or <laughs> The Big Liar. In fact, people in Mendy were sure that he had exaggerated his role in aiding Monsieur Perrault. On this trip, I also spent time in Brussels, where I met the widow of his colleague, Anselm Verny. And I did two interviews with William Uge, the Belgian resistance leader and author of the two books that I had read early on. Both Madame Verny and Uge had escaped to Spain in the spring of 1943, guided by Serchar, and had vivid recollections of his bravery and eccentricities and of their dangerous passage through the Irati forest. Uge gave me this underground newspaper, which was an example of material being relayed out of occupied France via the cable. This trip had a big impact um, uh, through the process of synthesizing the wealth of information I gathered and then reviewing that material and my observations with Dr. Scapens over several months, key things started to come into focus. Most notably, I began to understand the dual image of Sarochar, the shepherd passeur, revered by Dr. Scapens for his superhuman courage, but mocked as the village buffoon and blagueur by the local residents. I also realized that William Uge was an important war hero, but whose post-war life, unlike Dr. Scapens, had been anticlimactic, and that his account was very much an embellished personal narrative. For the first time, Dr. Scapens contradicted several of the descriptions Uge had given about events, where in fact, he had had no involvement. So while Sarachar and Uge had had vital but compartmentalized roles in the dangerous scheme in Mendive, engineered by Dr. Scapens, as the flame keepers of the story, they had shaped collective memory and generated much of the lore that had become entwined in the story afterwards. From these first years of documentary work, I had come to realize how, improv <laughs> how improvisational this kind of research is, which was in fact a mix of oral history interviews and old fashioned detective work, tracking down leads and corroborating stories. Lots of cold calls, lots of triangulation. For the remaining years of research, I was a much more informed interview, interviewer, not only with a better command of the story, now able to separate fact from fiction, but with greater interest in finding out how people knew the information they were telling me, first or second hand, and from whom. With Dr. Scapin's trust, I could also engage him in deeper reflections about his relationships, and at last, he was willing to, to show me photos, letters, and other documents from his modest archive. <clears throat> this was one of his fake IDs. <laughs> Among the treasures he eventually shared were these IDs. I also gained new perspective on his post-war re reticence. The pieces of the puzzle gradually fell into place through the 1990s, but there was still one missing element if I was going to fully portray the constellation of people involved in this bold and dangerous scheme. I needed to hear Mrs. Scapin's narrative. She often sat in on the interviews I did with her husband and occasionally would volunteer interesting details, so I knew she had not totally forgotten. The breakthrough was talking to her about the portraits she had painted during the war because I had heard a few stories about her artistic activity and had seen a few portraits during my interviews in the farmhouses of Mendive. This is a playmate of her children, whose <clears throat> named Jean Moretti, whose father and grandfather um, were among the clan of Italian cablists who came to Mendive to build and operate uh, the cable. She showed me an album of portraits done throughout the war, which enabled me to probe <clears throat> her emotional trials in Belgium, France, and England. So I also want to mention how living and working in Vermont fit into my research. Observing the operation of the cable system um, at a couple of Vermont ski resorts helped me visualize the 13 kilometers aerial cableway that brought the logs from the mountain forest down to the valley, and a visit to a vintage sawmill up in Hyde Park that had been operated since the 1940s gave me a firsthand picture of the sequence of transforming logs to lumber and the specialized skills of different workers. 
So now that I've retraced the extended story of uh, the, the extended backstory of the surgeon and the shepherd, I'd like to finish my presentation by briefly highlighting some equally unexpected results since the book was published in 2004. First, in March 2006, Dr. Scapins received the Légion d'honneur medal at a ceremony in Boston. It was 60 years after his heroic World War II service and a week before he died. It was the only time I saw him cry. When he arrived in Boston just after the war, he decided to talk about his work in the Belgian resistance as little as possible for many reasons, but primarily because he wanted to be known for his medical achievements, not his wartime feats. Hence his shock that winter night when I telephoned and identified him as Monsieur Perrault four mm. decades later. There was, however, a downside to remaining silent. Because he had been a double agent, there was uncertainty about the extent of his collaboration with the Germans. As I learned from a French diplomat, he had been nominated previously, but the French government had been reluctant to award this medal to him. But finally, the book had cleared the air. Mm -hmm. While it has been exciting to open readers' eyes to this unknown or little known resistance story, it has been especially moving to reconnect people with lost or little known family and community history. In 2011, a French edition was published and I did a short book tour. I was unsure how people in the area would react because I was upending their notion of what had been called l'épopée d'Irati or the epic of Irati. Mm -hmm. And even though I was somewhat familiar, especially in Mendive, I was still an outsider. At book signings and community events, people expressed deep appreciation for my documentary work. And I heard again and again from people in their 30s and 40s how important this book was as a conversa conversation starter between generations, enabling them to talk for the first time in depth with their parents and grandparents about their wartime experiences. And finally, to the most recent and surprising outcome of my publishing adventure. Various readers have been inspired to go explore the Basque country, but the most unexpected development is that a recently formed heritage group, the Basque Pyrenees Freedom Trails Association, used my book as the basis for their first commemorative trek in the Pyrenees. It is the newest trail in a growing European-wide network being developed by the Escape Lines Memorial Society, an organization based in the UK that works with local partners to commemorate the great escapes of World War II. I helped the organizers to recruit family members and other participants. I was one of 25 people who came from three continents to participate in the two-day mountain pilgrimage in June 2018 that retraced a part of the escape route through the Irati forest from France into Spain. 15 of the 25 were family members of the key figures in the resistance operation. The youngest was 18, and there were three 80-year-olds who did the 30K hike. It was the first time most of them had been to this mountain valley and the Irati forest. To my amazement, Francois Gauthier, the French consul general, who had conferred the Légion d'honneur award to Dr. Scapins in 2006, came with his wife on the trek. <clears throat> During the weekend, a Basque film crew followed us. They produced an award-winning 30-minute award documentary called Réseau Sans Nom. Um, and this is what you'll get linked to in the follow-up um, email, which is now available on YouTube. <clears throat> and they also produced a three-minute short, which I want to conclude with. It provides eloquent testimony of the power of place to recover historic memory and to understand wartime experiences, both spoken and unspoken of previous generations. Basque Pyrenees Freedom Trails Association is a charitable organization uh, based in the Basque country which is dedicated to recovering the historical memory of what were called the escape lines during World War II throughout the Basque Country. Escape lines were uh, networks or groups of people or individuals 
who sheltered those who were seeking to escape from uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. Well, our objectives are to recover that memory of the, uh, the bravery shown by Basque people at that time. And the most interesting part for us is retracing the routes and walking those routes uh, and, and getting people interested in walking in the footsteps of their forefathers. People really understand then what, what, people, what people endured at that time. What we're most looking forward to this weekend is to is welcoming back um, all of the family members of, of the key people in uh, the escape line operation that, that went from Mendiv in Iparalde to, uh, to Navarra. Um, the, for example, the Skippens family, and in particular, Claire Skippens, the daughter of Charles Skippens, the eldest son of Cyril Pomerense, uh, Boris, uh, will be traveling with his family all the way from Brazil. And um, the Vernoy family from, from Brussels, they're traveling down. We have people coming from Ireland, from England, from Belgium, from France, um, as I said, from Brazil, from Canada, and from the United States. Meg Ostrom, who wrote the seminal work, the book, The Surgeon and the Shepherd, about the escape line. So we're really looking forward to everybody meeting up. I'm here with a group of people who are all much younger than I am and uh, who are all interested in the escape routes. During World War II, it was very moving for me to drive into Madrid and to see the people I knew. Mon père a beaucoup parlé des racines, mais il n'a jamais, il, il, il jamais parlé que c'était aussi beau que ça. Moi, j'ai déjà beaucoup voyagé, mais j'ai rarement vu quelque chose qui est aussi beau, qui est magnifique. C'est un endroit de, de Dieu ici. Pour moi, et je pense pour mes oncles, ma mère, mes oncles et tantes qui étaient là avec, avec moi aujourd'hui, avec nous, Je pense que c'était euh, marcher sur leurs traces, euh, passer là où ils sont passés, voir la difficulté que ça a dû être, en se disant que nous, on le fait dans des conditions de soleil, de beau temps, d'amitié, et qu'eux, ils le faisaient dans des conditions de nuit, de mauvais temps, de faim, d'angoisse, de, de peur et de danger. Et pour nous, c'était euh, essayer de de se remettre dans leurs traces, peut-être de recréer un lien avec euh, avec eux de cette manière-là, et de leur dire merci. Anyone who recovers and rediscovers um, the stories of the escape lines are, are immediately drawn into them. It's exciting to, to put that out there and, and to watch people uh, enjoy seeing seeing the information and the stories again. That's it. Yep. Questions? So, yes, questions? yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. There's basically one long comment. If, if so not a question, but I have a lovely memory. I knew Dr. Sheppens in the 70s and 80s. My brother Robin Cook, who's an ophthalmologist and well-known author, introduced us. Uh, Dr. Sheppens invent, invented the indirect ophthal ophthalmoscope. I uh, discovered many diseases, although many docs didn't believe them. I ended up as a medical illustrated illustrator, um, uh, illustrating some of his late articles and presentations. Okay, and where they knew him. And this is this, this. Um, okay. The, the question for Meg: uh, You mentioned the escape line was used both to pass documents and people. Who were yeah. the, some of the some of the individuals who were rescued this way? Were you able to find out who some of the resistance for? figures were who escaped this way? That's such a good question. <laughs> um, so um, this uh, escape operation really served two kinds of people. Um, it served Belgian VIPs who were either high level officials or high level um, uh, Belgian resistance agents. And um, and the, and those were the people who were being escorted um, or, or, or and guided mm -hmm. by Sarah Shar. And so I did interview um, some of those. I interviewed Uje. I interviewed Madame Verny, who escaped. Um, uh, so that um, and. <clears throat> The estimate of how many people were actually um, helped by this line is is imprecise, 
it, it Dr. Scapin's thought that it was probably about a hundred and about a couple dozen of them fell into this group of the Belgian VIPs. But most of the people who escaped were young labor were were young French labor draft dodgers, who <clears throat> who, um, who, uh, who came to work at the factory, and then or actually who came to work work at, to work for the company and worked up in the mountains, um, and escaped on their own, and um, one of my great frustrations is that I have I've only been able to interview one of those one of that group of over probably uh, 70 people because these young labor uh, <clears throat> draft dodgers it was called the service du travail obligatoire, obligatoire um, had no idea that the, the, uh, that this was a uh, as one person said, un décor du théâtre, that this was a, an engineered scheme. They just thought it was their good luck that they had cut, that they had found this industrial operation that where they could get employment and then use as an escape um, a, 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 to get out of the country. So um, the the answer is I I interviewed a few of um, the people involved in the resistance but have been frustrated that I haven't been able to track down um, uh, the this people from this other group who were really the majority of people who escaped. And I haven't given up. Um, uh, there, interestingly, another um, sort of offshoot of this project has been that there is a local group who is now um, documenting the whole history of the sawmill. And, they are they are putting out the call to anyone who worked um, at the uh, Syrie de Mendiv um, uh, that they want to do oral histories. And so my hope is that somehow they will find people um, who work there um, and who and then and who were uh, during this period and will pass their names to me. Um, like at this point, they're 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 probably gone, but their families know about um, the fact that they worked at the sawmill. So that's the answer. Yeah, Meg, Meg, I have a, I have a question, and that is, do you do you have any information on where these people went, what happened to them once they made it over the mountains into what was, after all, fascist Spain? Yes. That we know pretty, that that information um, is pretty clear. Most of them ended up in a span, initially in a Spanish internment camp. Um, uh, that was sort of standard for, especially um, the, the STO draft dodgers um, landed in an internment camp and then were held there for uh, anywhere from like two to, two to six months. Um, and then some of them uh, um, got to Africa and then fought in the and they it, fought in the in the rest of the war. Um, others hung out in Spain. Um, the high level Belgian officials pretty much got um, were uh, es were uh, ferried after a series of they m most of the Belgians. The high-level Belgians <clears throat> either landed in uh, San Sebastian or Madrid, um, and then from Madrid they either went from Madrid to Gibraltar or Madrid to Lisbon, and then to England. And how did how did Chapin once he made it over? How did he get through? He um, uh, they made he 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 escaped with Cyril Pomerantsev. Um, in the summer of 1943, and they uh, they went first to San Sebastian, then they were in Madrid, and then they were in Lisbon. Um, uh, that's it's described in the book. That oh, that yeah, that's okay. one of the greatest. That's one of the greatest. Th there's sort of three great escapes that happen, um, or that are described in the book. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the other thing about the comment um, about the uh, Dr. Scapin's inventing the um, indirect um, binocular ophthalmoscope, 
he um, when he when he got to England, he resumed his um, practice as an ophthalmologist, and in the bombed out basement of um, the eye hospital in London, he built the prototype for that instrument, mm -hmm. um, and that instrument is now in the Smithsonian. <laughs> From Dan, how how long was the operation actually running? Of, of um, well, actually. Um, there were sort of two periods because uh, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Scapens was there from June of 1942 through July of 43. And after he almost got arrested, it continued um, for another year um, through uh, May of uh, May, June of 1944. Um, so it actually, it, um, it, it, it lasted almost two years. And like many other kind of escape operations, it, um, they, um, it kind of morphed. If it survived, it morphed into something else. So um, it, was, it, it lasted for two years. Yeah. Any hey, other? Are, yes. are there other questions? Yeah. yeah, just quickly, Scapens is is that Swiss, French, unusual no, name? It's it's Flemish. Um, it's Scapens is a Flemish name, um, and uh, I also got um, somewhat exposed to the sort of long history of um, Flemish French tension in Belgium, mm -hmm. um, because <clears throat> his family. Uh, Mucron is on the not only on the border of um, the uh, of Flanders and um, Wallonia, but also on the border of France. Um, and he grew up speaking both Flemish and French. Um, so he, it was, it, the family was mixed. Yes. Anything more? Oh, that's Lise. Yes. Bonjour. Eric, if I may, the Bois Gautier, who Beg spoke of and showed a picture of, is also credited, and he's a, a consul general to France, and he was in Boston, and he's also credited with the beginning of the Enfleur sister city here in Burlington, Vermont, and Enfleur, France. And I am grateful to him because because of that interaction, we have Beth Brody and Meg Pond on our committee these days and we're making this kind of conversation possible. So thank you, thank you so much for mentioning Francois Gautier. <laughs> and he, Great. He, I don't know if you you, you caught it, but he, he's actually in the, in the short documentary, he was walking with Claire Scapens um, um, with his wife, and in um, you you see him quite a bit in the longer documentary. He doesn't talk, but he's there, um, and that was just so amazing to me because um, he um, he uh, after he left Boston, he had various postings um, and ended ended up in France, and I kept in touch with him and. Um, and I told him about the, the walk that was happening in 2018, and I was just astounded that um, he participated, he and his wife participated. Yes, yes. Also, thank you for putting, uh, this was a wonderful presentation. I can't wait to know more. <laughs> Read the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Meg. Yes. yes. And if it's okay, I would love to share this yeah, presentation. Yeah. Yep. With the, the new consul general, yep. Mustafa Sokart in Boston to France, because I think now having listened to this today with Eddie Elspon's eyes and all of you in attendance, I think there's an interest and there's also potentially maybe we can help find some of those people you can't find yet. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, you know, um, there have been so many, I have to tell you this just in, in closing, there have been so many unexpected um, contacts of people um, who have uh, who who know Dr. Scapens um, or who have some connection. Um, there have been three or four people in Vermont whom I would never have expected um, 
who, for instance, the, the, the most recent one is a retired ophthalmologist who lives in, um, who divide, who has a summer place in Moortown, Vermont, who, um, whose family, he's a Dutch um, ophthalmologist whose family um, housed Dr. Scapins when he was a resident back in the 30s. Um, I mean, that's, <laughs> um, it's, and all this sort of, this is, for me, it's been just this wonderful, continu a continuous uh, series of coincidences. So I'm, you know, and the more that people know that I'm on the hunt, and 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 I really hope that um, if I can track down some of the families of these, um, of the of the labor draft dodgers and find out what actually what happened to them after they left France, um, and how involved they were in the war and what they did afterwards, that I'll that I can write an epilogue to the book. That that's that's what that's my ultimate goal. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the whole illustration. And those of us who have not read the book will probably now get onto it. And <laughs> uh, and we will proceed accordingly. So, so, good, so good luck with the ongoing hunt. Thank you. Okay. Merci. Bonne journée. Bonne journée. Bye.